The Mile End Group has a tradition of starting and ending on time, so we'll uh, try and preserve that. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Nick Montague. I'm the Chairman of Council, which is the governing body at Queen Mary, and I'm delighted to be chairing this evening's 86th meeting of the Mile End Group. I'm particularly pleased, if I may say so, to see such a very large student attendance, which is a trend that we very much hope will continue. I'd also like to emphasize how very grateful we are, as always, for the continued sponsorship of Hewlett Packard for this event. For those of you who want to tweet, it is at Mile End Group, and we will go on till 7.45, at which point we'll adjourn for a reception outside. It's my very great pleasure this evening to welcome Sir Nigel Scheinwald as the speaker. Nigel has had a career of the utmost distinction in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, concluding it successively as UCREP, the permanent representative to the European Union in Brussels, then as Tony Blair's advisor on foreign policy, and concluding it as ambassador to Washington. He was proverbial for his savvy in all things foreign affairs, from the fine detail to the political nuance. And I think it's a pretty fair bet that if Nigel had still been ambassador in Washington, the briefing for the prime minister would have been such that when appearing with David Letterman, he would have known what Magna Carta <laughs> meant. Uh, the fact that he, that he didn't speaks volumes for how neither our Washington Embassy nor Eton is what it used to be. <laughs> uh, there are few people, indeed there is nobody, who would be better qualified to speak to us this evening on the significance for this country of the 2012 American election, and therefore I'm delighted to welcome Nigel to do just that. Well, thank you very much, Nick, for the, uh, for the introduction. And uh, when people go through uh, what I've recently uh, done, I always make clear that I started in number 10 working for Prime Minister Blair in August of 2003, so a few, a few months after the conflict uh, in Iraq. But I'm sure we'll come to that later on. Um, I want to talk, first of all, a little bit about the race. I don't want to go into that in huge detail, but I want to set the scene for you on the contours of this um, election before getting on to... Um, the choices involved and what it might mean for the, uh, for the UK. Um, just three things, really, to start us off about um, this race. The, the predominant backdrop is, of course, um, the American uh, economy, and it remains a pretty negative um, backdrop. Um, as we know, American unemployment remains stubbornly above um, 8%, and I think it's right, and you will be able to correct me, I'm sure, that no sitting president has been re-elected with more than 7.8% unemployment uh, in the United States. I think times are different and the optics are different, but that's an important um, theoretical benchmark. We've had five years of housing crisis and repossessions. Obama's economic policies, by and large, have been uh, unpopular, uh, including uh, Obamacare. Um, and most people think that his record um, has been, at best, uh, patchy. So his approval rating, um, which is one of those guides to um, political performance, his approval rating has um, been stuck um, below uh, 50% um, for most of um, his presidency and as low as the, the low 40s during this, um, during this year, now up a bit as I'll go on to say. And the other thing, um, he has a, um, uh, on paper um, a successful and well-qualified uh, opponent and running mate. Um, so this is a race in which, um, in a mood of anti-incumbency which exists in America, um, as elsewhere in the West, um, it's, a, it's a year in which Obama is vulnerable. Um, but all that said, um, uh, the economy is gradually starting to pull around. You see some, um, what we used to call green shoots. Um, there's been a gas revolution uh, in the United States, which means there'll be at least a generation of cheap energy. Um, growth this year uh, expected to be about 2.3%, uh, which we in Europe would, um, would uh, be very, very happy to see. 
the housing situation is improving, and so on. And confidence um, appears to be uh, improving too. And I, in a recent poll, um, I saw that 48% of Americans believe the standard of living is improving. That surprised me, but if that's the trend, then it's, uh, it's interesting. Second thing, personality. As we all know, personality more important um, in, uh, in American than uh, at least traditionally in European uh, politics. Um, and in the end, um, it comes down to something of a vote on the incumbent, but it's also um, a contest between two candidates. And Joe Biden, the vice president, uh, is, uh, is fond of saying, uh, don't compare me with the almighty, compare me with the alternative. Um, and in this race, uh, on one of the key indices, which is this American concept of favorability, which I take to be a sort of mixture of leadership qualities and empathy. On favorability, Obama has done consistently much better than, uh, than, than Romney, even before um, the recent uh, misspeaks. And uh, he has about a 10-point lead on, the, on that sort of favorability uh, index. And that's important when Americans are choosing, uh, are choosing their president. By contrast, Romney has run... Um, what I think a lot of Republicans, and a lot of others, of course, as well, have seen as a uh, relatively weak campaign. It's been rather static. It's allowed Romney to be painted by the other side before he could present himself to the uh, American uh, electorate. Peggy Noonan, who was uh, Ronald Reagan's speechwriter, writes today in the Wall Street Journal. I recommend her to anyone who is interested in American politics. She wrote in the journal the other day that the uh, Romney campaign was a rolling calamity um, and that a sort of CEO was needed to take, take charge of it, uh, even at this uh, late stage. So personality and campaign, second factor. Uh, and lastly, on foreign policy, um, this, um, I think, wasn't really expected to be a foreign policy election any more than 2008 turned out to be a foreign policy uh, election. Um, but... They've had another 9-11, uh, had a 9-11 a few weeks uh, ago with the murder of the American ambassador in Libya. There's increased attention on American policy towards the Arab world. So it could rise up somewhat um, onto the uh, electoral agenda. And I suppose the Republicans will hope that that might give them an opening. I think there are two things which uh, speak against that. First of all, it's hard for the Republicans to present um, to present Obama in the traditional Republican um, uh, way um, as, as weak on security, as he's the president who did actually succeed um, in, uh, um, in bringing Osama bin Laden's life uh, to an end and in um, adopting very tough tactics, drone attacks and, uh, and, other, and other attacks um, on uh, terrorists in Pakistan and, in, and elsewhere. So um, to some degree, he's immunized himself against that charge. And secondly, his cautious approach to American intervention in the world, his ending of the war in Iraq, his uh, drawing down of American forces now in Afghanistan, appears to me at least to be in tune with the American public mood, which is cautious about these things after the unhappiness of the uh, two wars that I mentioned. So they may try, but I think that that will be, um, that will be difficult um, in the uh, weeks ahead. So the result of all that is that, at the moment, Obama has the edge. Um, he has a lead of about four points, three and a half, four points. And looking at those swing states that everyone looks at at this time of the race, there are maybe eight or ten of them, um, Obama is ahead at the moment in all of them, some by very small margins, but in some of the important ones, like um, Ohio and Florida, he's actually moving comfortably ahead of Romney. Now, that can change. There are still a few weeks left, and the all-important debates uh, don't start for another uh, few days. Um, but it's, an, in but it's a, an important point that we've reached, where Obama is, for the first time, just showing a little bit of um, blue water between himself and his uh, opponent. Now, this election, I've been back in the UK since February. Um, this election has obviously excited less interest here and in the rest of Europe um, than, 2000, uh, than the election in 2008. And I think it's fair to say part of that, the, the reason is that the main race, um, until uh, recently anyway, was the race among the Republicans for the uh, nomination. And by and large, um, people in Britain and the rest of Europe are a bit uneasy about the state of the Republican 
uh, party, maybe have a long-term uh, bias and lack of understanding of politics on the right uh, in the United States. But whatever, for whatever the reason, the increase, uh, the, the interest in the election is obviously going to increase now. Um, and I think you know, British people tend to be rather intrigued by American elections, not least because they are so different. They weren't always the theatre they are today. Um, I just noticed um, that uh, one politician in the early 19th century in America said that uh, the presidency is not an office to be either solicited or declined. Um, that's changed. And as late as 1916, President Wilson uh, called campaigning a great interruption to the rational consideration of public questions. Well, we've moved a long, long way away from that. We're now into more or less permanent um, campaigning and vast amounts of money being spent. Now, um, does it matter? Um, in some sense, in one sense, of course, it matters less than it did um, a few decades uh, ago because the United States is relatively less powerful um, than it was. And America has been through an incredibly difficult decade. It's been a difficult decade for all of us, but a number of the things that have happened, um, the vulnerability caused by 9-11, um, the shock of the challenge to their economic and financial model in 2008, a number of those things fall particularly heavily um, on the United States. And it's led, as you know, to a debate about whether America can recover from this, whether it's in uh, a sort of permanent um, decline, uh, and whether China is just about to clock in as the new world superpower. Now, I myself believe um, that that declinism is, at very best, um, premature, and I see continuing strengths in the United States. Of course, the world has changed, and we're now in a much more uh, multipolar and contested um, world uh, system. But the US economy is still a $15 trillion economy, and even when China overtakes it, as it will at some point over the next decade or so, American per capita income will be greater than China's probably for the lifetimes of everyone in this room. Um, it's going to be very difficult for China with its huge population to uh, overtake America. And the American economy continues to have extraordinary strengths, not least in its universities, in its research, uh, in its innovation, uh, which you see across a number uh, of sectors. It remains the predominant world power militarily, and it has that comfortable geographical position of being secure in its own region, which China certainly doesn't. It's got an uneasy relationship um, with, its, um, with its neighbors. And I don't think, um, even if um, uh, we thought that all those things were wrong, that it's necessarily obvious that China aspires to the sort of uh, leadership which the United States and before it the UK a century or so ago um, had. Uh, I think America believes that it will continue to sustain its leadership role in the world, certainly for the next generation, for the next 20 or 30 years. But what Obama has tried to do in the last uh, couple of years has been to define a, a different style of American leadership involving uh, less political and financial risk than those taken on by his uh, immediate uh, predecessor. And that accounts for the pivot to Asia and a number of the other policies that we've been uh, considering. Um, and I think, therefore, that the US will remain the most important country in the world, the most significant economically and politically um, uh, over the next 20 or 30 years. So that's why it matters. That's why, um, um, that's why um, the elections do count. Next question, does the choice matter? Um, does, uh, is it going to make any difference in policy terms which of these people um, becomes president? Well, there are obvious differences between them, and both sides actually during their recent conventions made quite a lot of the starkness of the choice. They made a lot of that for their own, uh, for their own reasons. Um, but I think that economic turbulence in America and around the world um, and the state of the world actually um, constrain the choices that whoever wins this election will have. And of course, in the American system, even if you win the presidency, um, you don't necessarily win the Congress. Um, it's inconceivable that Obama will have two chambers, um, once again, uh, of the same party. It's likely to be 
uh, were almost certain to be another Republican House of Representatives. There is a tussle in the Senate, um, but whatever happens, even if that too goes Republican, which I think is a little bit unlikely, um, nevertheless, there will not be a filibuster-proof majority for the Republicans in the Senate. So power, once again, will be scrappily exercised and contested um, in the next Congress, pretty much whatever, um, whatever happens. Um, and the outcome, I think, is a bit unclear on that until we see the numbers after um, Election Day. On foreign policy, there are certainly some differences uh, of emphasis between Obama and Romney on Israel, on Iran, um, on China, uh, on Russia. We can go into those. Um, but, you know, when, uh, if Romney does become um, president, uh, things, I think, will look a little different from the way they looked when he spoke about foreign policy he hasn't done a lot of, neither candidate has, um, on the campaign trail. He will receive a lot of professional advice from his commanders, from his policy um, advisors. Uh, and Obama himself has become um, a more, maybe a more mainstream and pragmatic president than a number of people um, thought he would um, when he was uh, campaigning and when he was a senator. So I don't think we can just assume that um, the Romney positions we've heard of during the campaign will translate, literally, um, into a Romney presidency. So, some changes, some, some differences. Why does it matter to the UK? Well, um, um, I'll go on maybe to say a word about UK-US relations at the end. But above all, in our economic situation, we want an American economy that is growing um, and is open. That's not going to be the sole motor of um, our uh, slow, but we hope steady, uh, global economic uh, recovery. But it's going to be very, very important to us. Um, there's an immediate danger, some of you will have read about, which is the so-called fiscal cliff at the end of this year, where a number of programs will expire unless positive action is taken. And that includes some tax cuts, um, it includes some uh, social security and other uh, and other matters. And if all of them go, then there will be a, an, um, a negative impact on American growth of maybe um, two or three percent, maybe as high as that during the course of next year. So that would be very deflationary for the United States. It's quite difficult to know which of Obama or Romney would be more likely to handle that um, issue at the end of this year uh, better. Um, uh, I wouldn't say from a UK perspective, our interest is only that it should be settled and settled without unsettling the markets and, um, and without the brinkmanship um, of some of the earlier economic decisions. Um, but what I would say is that if Romney were to carry over into the presidency, um, either at the end of this year or by rolling the issue forward into early next year, his opposition to all tax increases, that would be something that I think um, here in Britain and for most um, other Europeans would seem out of sync with the sort of ways in which we have, we have approached um, cutting our debt and cutting our budget deficits. And in this country, my recollection from working in government, um, and Nick will certainly be able to correct me, is that our, our program here, of course uh, controversial, but our program here is about 25% tax increases and, uh, um, and 75, 70, 75% um, um, spending, spending cuts. So um, we have that uh, balance. It's roughly where the commission, which Obama set up a few years ago, uh, where they came out, but that was not accepted by either, by either side. Second thing we want, we want, an, uh, we want a recovering American economy, we want an open American economy. And trade has actually been a weakness for the Obama administration, partly because the American public is much less confident about international trade than its predecessors. So there's a lot of pressure from the unions, a lot of talk about outsourcing jobs that we've seen during the campaign. Um, and the public mood really has rather changed against um, against free trade since the heyday of the 1990s. All that said, um, this administration has given, given little leadership um, domestically or internationally on these issues. Now, there are people in the uh, Republican camp who are extremely experienced uh, in these issues, like, um, uh, like Bob Zellick former, uh, and uh, Rob Portman, Rob Portman, now a senator, um, both of them former US trade representatives, who, if he were to involve them in a Romney administration, would be um, very, very effective advocates for a forward American and an active American position uh, on that. 
Um, and we have a particular interest because Britain has been one of those countries supporting a new US-European uh, Union free trade agreement, um, the negotiations for which we would like to see, or our government would like to see, launch next year. So we would like a fair wind given to a resumption of trade liberalization uh, discussions, um, and that's important whoever the next president uh, is. Traditionally, the Republicans have been more free trade, but the Tea Party element in the Republican Party uh, is more cautious, so difficult to know how that will come out. Lastly, maybe before I come on to foreign policy, um, most people in Britain and in the rest of Europe um, would like the new American president to have policies which are environmentally sustainable. Now, it's going to be a struggle, whoever is president, um, and I would say impossible, to imagine that uh, um, climate uh, change, cap and trade type legislation will go through nationally in America. Obama, Obama tried and failed with a different arithmetic in the Congress. To me, I, I can't see that working out in the next Congress, whatever happens. But a Republican administration would undoubtedly clip the wings of the Environmental Protection Agency um, and would be more averse to um, a, a number of the initiatives which Obama has taken. Um, and I think that could also, that could um, become once again a source of friction uh, across the Atlantic as it was 10 years ago. And lastly, I think our interest um, for Britain is in an America which handles uh, the threats, and they obviously exist uh, internationally, handles those carefully and, responsi and responsibly. Uh, an administration which consults its allies properly and which to the maximum extent possible shares um, our world view. By and large, I think people in Europe, if you look at the opinion polls, still um, believe that Obama represents that. Um, whether they've gone into the detail or not, Obama still gets a sort of 60% plus approval rating in Western Europe, which is pretty high for um, politicians. Um, less clear, as I say, about, um, about Romney. Um, he would, uh, I think, change somewhat if he came into uh, office. On Iran, there will be a crunch point over the next couple of years. Whoever wins the White House, um, that's just because of the pace of the Iranian nuclear program and the evident impatience uh, in Iran. But if a Republican administration were to in any way encourage Israel to act uh, prematurely or precipitately, that would not be, I think, in the, either in the UK interest or the, European, the broader European interest and not what we've been arguing for uh, in, recent, in recent times. On China, maybe the most critical relationship for the United States in the, the, next, uh, the next decades. Um, Romney has said some harsh things on the campaign trail. Uh, Obama has, um, has also shown that uh, he's going to be tough with uh, China by, um, by initiating a new trade complaint against China, I think only last week. Um, but this is another area where the markets in particular um, and America's major trading partners would have some say with the new administration. And by and large, although there might be a tougher tone, there might be some, um, some action um, against uh, unfair parts of the Chinese trade and investment uh, regime. Uh, nevertheless, once again, I would expect the difference in office to be less than you might think from the campaign trail. I think the UK would work well um, with whoever is elected president, with either of these people. Um, the ironic thing about Romney's um, uh, statements on the Olympics when he was in London, which got everyone uh, excited, was that the reason he came to the UK was to show he wanted an excellent relationship with the British <laughs> government and people. And that didn't quite come over, I think, in, um, in what he said on the, uh, the Olympics. But I think he would make an effort with Britain and other traditional allies, and I think we've shown now after four years um, that the UK and other Western European countries can have good and productive relationships with Obama. Um, the UK-US relationship, much talked about. Um, this is a changed world, um, and maybe particularly um, for, the, uh, for the UK. Um, our relationship with the United States can't be based simply on pictures of um, Churchill and, um, and uh, Margaret Thatcher and their uh, American opposite numbers. It can't be based just on history um, and sentiment. It does need to prove its value um, to successive generations uh, over here. For us, I think the value uh, is there, 
we derive um, very considerable economic and political advantage from the close relationship which we have um, with what will remain the world's most important country. But obviously the politics of that have to be handled very, very carefully. And there's nothing more poisonous than the feeling, which has been around in Britain over the past decade, um, that uh, the UK is doing things mainly to appeal to its uh, American ally rather than because they're in the UK uh, interest. Uh, so to my mind, that means where you do disagree, and of course we disagree on quite a lot of things, it's better to speak up about those things rather than keep them completely private because that gives, I think, our own people the sense that we're engaged in a two-way uh, discussion and are not, uh, and are not saying yes um, the whole time. On the other hand, there are some things where you have to keep your um, uh, agreements, uh, disagreements initially at least, private. Uh, and of course, you have to be careful not to break down the essential uh, trust and confidence in each other, which is important to any good relationship, whether it's between governments or, uh, or between your, uh, a client and uh, his or her lawyer, whatever it is, uh, relationships depend on um, an element of trust. Um, so I think that for, for the United States, uh, they need allies too. Let's not think it's entirely one-sided. In the world we're in, where networks are important, alliances are very useful to a country like the United States in magnifying its own importance, taking some of the strain off the United States. That's what they're doing in Asia, uh, emphasizing their alliances with countries like Japan and South Korea and Australia, um, just as they're doing other things as well. And the same, I think, with a, a country like the UK, part of the EU, part of uh, NATO. Um, we have a lot that we bring to the table, and we shouldn't be defensive about realizing that and talking about it. In many parts of the world, Europe, the Middle East, um, South Asia, when you're dealing with intelligence or with terrorism, Britain has real assets to bring to bear to any international dialogue or um, discussion. Now, of course, we have to be careful. We have to make sure that our own austerity program here um, doesn't slash our defense, intelligence, foreign policy assets uh, any more um, than we're planning to do. I think we're um, up against the bone now, and if we go further on defense in the second part of the decade, then we will be much less credible to America and to other, um, and to other allies as a defense partner. And there are some real questions, obviously, about the British um, security and political role in Asia. We have a big commercial interest there, but are we going to be involved at all um, in, other, in other ways? So in short, I think um, it's um, pretty logical for us to be interested in the uh, US election. It's not just a matter of tradition and uh, a rather sort of lurid interest in their uh, occasionally odd politics. I think it's because it's, it's important to us um, to follow and to understand what's going on in that election and to have some senses of, of the choices involved, particularly in so far as they might affect the UK in the four years, in the four years ahead. I'm very ready to take questions. Thank you very much. Nigel, thank you very much indeed. That was tremendous. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. Could those asking them please say who you are before you ask? Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Tim Bale. I'm Professor of Politics at um, Queen Mary. You mentioned the pivot to Asia, as you call it, that the Americans are making. Um, isn't one of the problems for the British government, indeed for any European government, um, keeping America actually interested in this continent? Um, yes, I, I, I use, I think that's the phrase they use, the pivot to Asia. And, I and as I understand a pivot, and I suppose you can have a very big pivot, but I, I think of it as being a sort of course correction rather than a fundamental, rather than a fundamental change. But to answer your point, I mean, I think that um, you're right, there has been a change in America's appreciation of Europe. I mean, 20 years ago, we were very much the, the center of American focus in defense, foreign, and security policy. And I think what's happened since is that we've now, we're now judged less as the, the theater for American um, concerns, more as whether we are effective partners in handling um, global issues. And that's a, you know, a tougher test. For, for us. In Afghanistan, um, a number of countries have not really um, uh, shared the burden as much as we, the UK, would like. We've been, as you know, 
um, by far the second largest contributor pretty much all the way through since 2006. Uh, in other areas, we've done better. On Iran, for example, I think Britain and, Amer and, and the rest of the EU have been very effective partners for the United States. Indeed, uh, we led the effort going back um, nearly 10 years ago um, to, to have this two-track uh, approach to, to Iran. So it's, it's a mixed picture, but I think you're right. American views of Europe um, have changed and probably are more transactional today um, than, they, than they were before. But I'd just say, you know, when we're talking about partnership, um, partnership in places like the Middle East, partnership in South Asia, is going to be very, very important to America. Because as I say, I, I don't think it's Asia and nothing else. I think America is going to remain very involved in the Middle East and South Asia because of Israel, because its, um, because its uh, um, security interests are involved there because of the threat of terrorism. So I don't think America is going to be anything other than a global player, but it's going to think more about and invest a bit more of its resources in Asia Pacific in the years ahead, just as we are. Yes. Down here. Hello, um, my name is Nigel White. Um, my question, you mentioned in passing um, Iran and prospect of perhaps unilateral intervention by Israel. I've read speculation that Israel might even try and uh, intervene before the election because of the, of the leverage that would, uh, would cause. What would be your take on, on, on the effect of that in, in terms of, of the US election, should Israel so do? Well, it's difficult to know. I, I know that the opinion polls, which I haven't, I haven't seen a recent one, but certainly in the spring of this year, the American opinion polls did not show um, anything like a majority of Americans wanting early military action. They were happy with, broadly happy with the policy of increased pressure through sanctions and political pressure, which we had. As I said, if you look at each of the issues we've had recently, um, Libya, Syria, and, uh, and Iran, um, I think, and some of you will have maybe looked at this in more detail, my impression is that the American public remains cautious um, and, uh, and wary of, uh, of interventions given the experience of, um, of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And although in, neither of those, in none of those cases would you be talking about a ground intervention and occupation in the, in the way that we've had with Afghanistan and Iraq, nevertheless there's a, there's a degree of public um, uh, public unease. So, um, which isn't to say that if, it, if the Israelis were to do that, um, that the circumstances and the way it happened wouldn't, um, you know, wouldn't evoke a more positive response from the American people, because there is sympathy for Israel, and that's uh, cross-party um, and, uh, and not just orchestrated by, um, by the pro-Israel lobby there. There's a, a very, very widespread basis for it in, the American, uh, in American society. Um, I hope I'm right in thinking that it's a bit less likely um, um, than it seemed a few months ago. Um, and I think what Israel would have to consider in that is not just um, a potential short-term gain, although I'm not by any means convinced of that. Um, they'd have to think about the long-term relationship with the United States. They rely on the United States um, in a way which, uh, you know, which a number of countries do. Not a, not a huge number, but they have a very, very dependent relationship with America. Um, and I think that a lot of Americans would be put off by the opportunism of, um, of doing this just before their election at a time of introspection in the United States. Um, and that might well have a very negative long-term impact on US-Israeli uh, relations. And they'd have to, hang, they'd have to um, uh, weigh that in the balance. Uh, I think the issue will have to be addressed and one, and Obama has definitely been discouraging the Israelis from taking um, in any, any early action. But of course, he's also been saying this is a serious problem, and I do not accept Iran having a nuclear uh, weapon. And so at some point over the next couple of years, and there's an Israeli election next year, of course, as well, um, at some point over the next couple of years, um, this issue will have to be, um, will have to be addressed. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stephen Alexander, first year international relations student. I have a question for Nigel. If you would be foreign policy advisor to the next American president, what would you advise them about Syria? Would you advise caution? 
or intervention if necessary. Thank you. I haven't, um, it's not a very likely scenario, I have to say, <laughs> uh, for better or worse. <laughs> um, I haven't seen a, um, a military intervention scenario which strikes me as, um, as feasible. I think you have to be practical about this if you look at it, if you look at any textbook <coughs> on grounds for intervention, you'll have various tests that you have to go through. One of them's got to be whether there's a practical uh, and realizable plan. And I think in this case, it's very different from Libya, um, partly because in Libya you had a sort of, um, you had an a, a territorial area which the opposition essentially held uh, in, in and around Benghazi in the east of the country. Um, and it was that area initially at least which the, um, which the international forces were trying to protect with their air power and so on. Um, and it was relatively easy for the United States to degrade Libya's air defense capability very quickly. They did that very effectively. Now it's much more difficult to see that happening in relation to Syria because the Syrians have much more support um, tradi traditionally at least from, uh, from Russia and from Iran with their defenses. There would be no um, uh, UN resolution, which is a different issue, but it has a practical um, uh, aspect to it as, uh, as well. And if you look at um, Syria at the moment, um, it does seem to me that it's very difficult to imagine how with everyone mixed up and fighting the whole time, how you could um, run the sort of air campaign which NATO ran um, in relation to Libya without um, um, killing you know, really huge numbers of, um, of people on the, on the side of, um, on the, side of the uh, insurgents and of the opposition. So I think it's very difficult to imagine, at the moment anyway, given the um, state of play on the ground, it might change um, a military option, which isn't to say I think you should do nothing. I think that the, um, the, the, the first requirement is to get a higher degree of international um, uh, agreement, uh, ideally unity, but something closer to agreement than what we've got. And I guess that instead of um, maybe talking um, about military action, which seems to me in the short term at least to be unlikely, it would be better to focus on things which can, um, which can isolate the regime more and, and draw them away, at least from, from Russia and from, um, and from China. They probably won't be drawn away quickly from Iran. And I wonder whether, I, I, you know, without being an expert on this, whether um, instead of something ostensibly military, whether some sort of humanitarian zone, which, um, which, the, uh, you know, which a country like Turkey working with others might be able to set up, uh, might not be a sort of intermediate way um, of involving the international community. Um, and it would bring some pressure to bear, I think, on the, um, on the regime. So I don't think this is at all straightforward. And, uh, and you know, I think if you look at the opinion polls, American public opinion, probably very similar to here, um, you know, would be pretty cautious about anything which, which drew us into something without a very clear military plan. Up there. Um, Paddy Ford, I'm a mere undergraduate. Um, do you see a gulf developing between the Tory party and the Republican party? Uh, it certainly appears in public, at least, that Cameron and Obama have a very good um, working relationship and quite a close personal relationship as well. Um, and you touched on the um, Romney Olympic gap and how savagely that was put down by Cameron earlier this year and also Cameron's refusal to meet any of the Republican candidates when he was in Washington earlier this year. Um, also, given that Cameron publicly backed Sarkozy in the French election and lost um, an ally there, where would um, a Romney victory leave Cameron on the international stage? Well, I, you know, he's, it's the same political family. I agree with you. I mean, I think if you look at the Conservative Party, um, the Conservative Party you know, has a sort of formal link to the Republicans, but traditionally it's had very, very close links um, uh, to the Democrats as well. It was after all Churchill and FDR. So, um, and I think that's not insignificant. I think the fact is that in our, in our system, so two and a half of our main parties feel more, more at ease with the, with the Democrats than the, than the Republicans. Um, and uh, I think they've had John McCain to um, conservative conferences, or at least had a video from, from him. So I, I think it's less stark than maybe you, um, you present it. 
Um, but in terms, of the, in terms of the government, actually Romney was here last year. He obviously had, had, his, had his moment this year. Um, he was here last year. He, uh, he, I think, as I said, I'm confident he would actually have a, a good relationship with, um, with the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister, I think, was careful not to say very much about what he said about the Olympics. It was Boris, I think, who was more um, out front, uh, characteristically, uh, on that subject. And I think even last night on uh, the David Letterman show, before we got to the Magna Carta, um, I think that the Prime Minister deliberately sidestepped a question about what Romney had said um, in London. So I don't think their, I think, you know, that, um, I don't think their relationship would be in any way um, a poor one if, um, if, they got, if, um, if Romney were to win. And um, at the very least, although uh, you know, one would have to see exactly who um, got positions in a Romney administration. There are a lot of people who are advising uh, Romney who know the UK well uh, and know our strengths in intelligence and uh, in, many other, in many other areas. Yeah, lady up there. Thank you. Dinah Glover. Um, I just wondered whether you um, thought um, that a cap on election expenses would benefit American politics or how much impact that might have? Well, the answer is, of course, yes. I mean, if you ask, you know, uh, if I had a, you know, if I, if I could decide this or anyone could decide it, I'm sure that they, um, I'm sure the answer is yes. A lot of Americans would like um, to see that. Uh, and I think David Cameron was applauded last night when he said that he only had a, he only spent 150,000 pounds on his uh, election campaign in 2005. So the, that New York audience was obviously uh, in favour of putting a cap on it. Um, I think it's very unlikely to happen, though. And if if you think, um, you know, why uh, this this campaign has been sort of turbocharged as far as the financing is concerned, it's because of a Supreme Court decision uh, two years ago. Which allowed, um, which gave greater license to private organisations, including business organisations, um, to fund campaigns. And these super PACs, which have been so important this year, particularly to the Republicans, but also now on the Democratic <coughs> side, they are very much a function of that, the Citizens United decision that was made by the um, Supreme Court. So I think that um, although this has been tried in the past, I myself feel it's it's pretty unlikely um, to, um, you know, to come about uh, in any significant way in the, uh, in the future. Down, right down the front, yeah. Hello, my name's Fiona Iles. Hang on, wait, can you wait for the microphone? Sorry, I'm just pointing to me, sorry. <laughs> I am pointing at you, but you need a microphone. <laughs> Hello, my name is Fiona Iles. I'm the wife of the Thatcher Archivist at Churchill College, Cambridge. I'd just like to talk to you, I wondered if you actually know about Obama, I presume you do. Is he as principled off camera as he is on? Gosh, that's, a, that's an interesting adjective. And um, yeah, I think so, I mean, I'm prin principled. Yes, I think so. Um, I, don't, I wouldn't say that I'm, um, I'm, I don't want to exaggerate my um, closeness to him. I've seen him quite a few times. I met him first, actually, when I was working at Number 10, when he came as a senator to Number 10. I saw him a few times before he became president, and then fairly regularly when he was president at Washington events and whenever our um, prime minister um, came over. So I've seen him in action quite a bit over the years without, I'm, I think, you know, um, regarding myself as in any way having a special insight into him. Principal, yes, I think so. I mean, I think that he, um, he to use maybe more, more familiar adjectives when it comes to Obama, he is thoughtful. The word that regularly comes across is cerebral. Um, he is professorial. Uh, he likes to work from sort of principles. He likes to question things. He likes to ask hundreds of questions sometimes. The reason why the Afghan review at the end of 2009 took so long was because he kept throwing it back because he wasn't happy with it. Um, on Libya was a very good example of um, the way Obama sometimes uh, goes on decision making. He wasn't happy with the idea of a no-fly zone because he um, said, well, actually, um, you know, what purpose would be achieved by, um, by preventing Libyan aircraft, Libyan uh, Air Force aircraft taking off when the main thing that we're looking at at the moment is a ground advance 
by Libyan forces. So although people around him, a number of them were very skeptical about any intervention, what Obama eventually agreed to was a no-fly zone and a no-drive zone. So any, any movement by forces on the ground would be, um, would be attacked by um, the NATO forces, which is what we eventually got, got through the, um, the, uh, the UN. So I think principle, yes. I think in the sense that he has some you know, basic um, you know, lines, of, lines of policy and argumentation. I think he's an internationalist, which is an important principle for, um, for us as allies. Um, but he's also very pragmatic. And if there's a, it's been oft, often said, I think, by some of the best commentators in America, that if there's a president whose style, a recent president, whose style he admires in foreign policy, it's George Bush, not his predecessor, but Bush 41, his, uh, um, the father, Bush the father, um, who was very pragmatic and calm and handled the end of the Cold War, the, the first um, uh, uh, war against Iraq, which was, of course, successful, um, and was known as a pragmatist and as a, and as a realist in foreign policy. And he admired the outcome of those policies, but also the way they handled foreign policy and the fact that Brent Scowcroft, as the national security uh, advisor, was a very successful national security advisor. So, I, I, principle, yes, but also, I think, um, pragmatic and fairly down to earth, uh, down to earth as well. But I don't think I think what you see is what you get with him, um, and with most politicians that tends to be the case. Down here. Uh, my name's Hugh Edwards. Uh, if you look at the history of the last fifty years of the relationship since 1945, U.S. U.K. Um, there have been, along the way, some very serious problems, like Grenada, Suez. Um, I, in, in Christopher Andrews' book on MI5, they said that J. Edgar Hoover had a very low opinion of MI5 and MI6 as a bunch of incompetent amateurs who'd uh, messed up with Philby, Burgess and McLean, etc., etc. And I believe for a time they closed down the sharing of intelligence for a while. And the other thing is that, of course, the relationship between the leaders varies. Uh, Ronald Reagan and Thatcher was excellent, less good with Jimmy Carter, and I don't think the Heath Nixon relationship was all that good. The, but we, it, it always seems to get back on track again. And you don't seem to get a loss of, you know, complete loss of confidence in, in the other. And it, it always seems to muddle through <laughs> somehow. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, and I think it's for a reason. I think the first thing to say is that um, the relationship we're talking about is actually very recent. I mean, if you look over the history of relations between this country and the United States since the revolution, for the vast majority of that period, it was difficult, fractious. Um, you know, it was only really um, you know, from the, um, the, the wartime period that this concept of a special relationship um, developed, and it was very much Churchill's uh, invention, but it was buttressed afterwards by that series of intelligence and defense agreements in the 40s and 50s, which remain the sort of, you know, the basis of, uh, of the relationship today. So, first thing to say is, I, I do agree, but I think that it's not a sort of state of nature, it's something that, um, that arose because of the war and then, then was solid because of the Cold War. Second, um, we plainly dispose of less power, the UK and US, um, than we did 60 years ago. So when Churchill and Roosevelt spoke, they had a, you know, would have had a reasonable hope that what they agreed was going to be translated into reality. Today's world is one in which both countries, both US and UK, have less power than before. But the UK certainly has significantly less power than in that wartime or immediately post-war um, period. Um, and many other people, the Chinese, the Indians, and others, um, you know, are on the rise. And, um, and so we are in a different sort of context from, um, from that one before. Uh, third point, uh, and I think you made it, this is a relationship in which personality does count. 
Um, it, it affects the, the quality of consultation. The American system is one um, where the, um, the attitude of the president, the person at the top, um, infects the administration uh, even more than is the case um, in a British administration with the views of a, of a prime minister. Um, and that's because, obviously, the, the people at the top of the American administration are handpicked by the White House. The top layer um, changes, as we know. Um, uh, and if there is a sense that uh, this is something which the president wants to get done, um, that, that his relationship with X um, is such that, um, that we want a, um, a support given, to initiatives with the UK, that can be very important. It was certainly the case, and I observed it um, when I was in Washington the first time in the 80s, uh, that uh, everyone around the US administration was so terrified of the president having to defend himself against Margaret Thatcher that, um, that, they, basically, that they would, within, a, you know, within certain tram lines, within certain uh, constraints, they would push things in a, in a, in a pro-UK direction. So I think the relationship at the top does matter. As you said, it transcends party. So with Reagan and Thatcher, it was, um, it was very much a marriage of, uh, of ideological soulmates. With, um, with Churchill and Roosevelt, not so. Uh, with Blair and, and Bush, not so on the generality of policy, on the handling of, um, of domestic policy, on climate change, on development initially. There was no real agreement between um, you know, you know, disagreements between Blair and, and Bush, but they agreed on the, on the response to 9-11. Maybe up there. Hello, Catherine Byers. I'm a civil servant at the Cabinet Office. Um, I want to ask you what you think a Romney loss will mean for the Tea Party. And I think it's interesting, Romney's taken a, a similar model as McCain did with his vice presidential choice, which is top of the ticket is relatively moderate, B vice president appeals more to the Republican base, obviously Sarah Palin a bit more out there than Ryan. Um, but do you think that if Romney loses and you know another moderate Republican loses, what we'll see next time is a Tea Party candidate at the top of the ticket? Um, well, um, it's possible. Um, it's, I suppose it is possible. And of course, Romney, you describe him as a moderate candidate. Um, he certainly was when he was governor. And, and there are elements of what we might call moderation in his platform today. But he's moved, he's moved in, a number of, in a number of areas. Um, and to attune himself to, um, uh, to his financiers and to um, where the energy is in the Republican, uh, in the Republican Party. Uh, so I think that the, 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 the likelihood is, if, if Romney were to, were to lose, that initially, at least in the Republican Party, um, the, the, the right would feel vindicated, and they would say that the problem was that um, you know, he wasn't a real conservative, and, uh, and they would double down. I don't know whether they would have, I think the likelihood is they might have a slightly smaller majority in the House of Representatives, they still have a majority. Uh, around the country, as we see, we see still, the Tea Party is pretty active. But when it comes to the next, um, the next election, there are clearly going to be some people who, you know, who are going to be in the race who would be more from the, um, the middle of the party. I don't know how many of these will, will in the end run, but people like um, uh, Jeb Bush, George Bush's uh, brother uh, in Florida, um, Mitch Daniels in Indiana may be unlikely to run, but he might be on the, on the ticket. Uh, even Chris Christie, who in a way excites the Republican base, he's a, he's a more, um, uh, in a way, a more conventional Republican figure um, than some of the people we saw in this, year's, uh, in this year's campaign. And they have, you know, maybe a little bit more stature than some of the people in this year's campaign as well, and so would withstand some of the pressures from the, uh, from the right. So I think that, that there might well be a move of the kind you predict. It's a, a, a familiar thing in politics, after all, to, to double down. Um, but, um, but I'm not sure that in the end it would translate into, um, into a, a far-right candidate. And the, um, if you look at mo most analyses of the American public, they don't suggest that would be an electoral um, winning strategy. Um, given that you're, you have a larger number of independents and undecided people in play, 
um, in, in American politics today. And by and large, they, they don't like shrill extremism from either side. So a Goldwater-type candidate um, you know, would not necessarily um, you know, do, um, do better. I remember Ronald Reagan, spent, you know, the, um, who was seen in su <coughs> something of that way uh, all the way through and, and, and as president, he spent quite a bit of time at the end of his election campaign in 1980 presenting himself as someone that you could trust um, to run the country effectively and was a pragmatic president as well as being very, very well attuned, obviously, to Republican ideals. And that's why he would be regarded as, um, as, um, as one of the few genuinely great American presidents of the 20th century. Thank you. Hello, my name is Saima. Um, I'm a journalist and I've actually spent the last five years in Pakistan. So right. I, was, um, I was actually at Osama bin Laden's compound the day he was killed and have spent a lot of time there talking to people about drone attacks as well. So my question is going to be about drone attacks um, and, and picking up on what you said about the US-British relationship as far as what discussion goes on. Um, to what extent is Britain supportive of America's drone attack plan or active in it? Well, I think we've avoided, I mean, I'm, I can't speak for the government anymore um, and, and don't, because um, that's one of the fun bits about not being, uh, not being a member of the diplomatic service after 35 years. So I can't give you an official answer, as it were, but I can give you my impression from you know, um, my time, my time uh, in Washington, which is that both the Labour government and this government, I think, um, despite no doubt a lot of um, um, very perceptive questions like yours, I don't think they ever really took a position, took a very direct position on the um, on drone attacks themselves. They've avoided doing that. They have said that the effect of the drone attacks has been helpful for the UK in the sense that it's reduced the threat. Um, but there's no doubt that the elimination of several layers of operational command within Al-Qaeda in Pakistan have um, reduced, the, reduced the threat, maybe by, um, maybe by um, displacing it uh, elsewhere. But whatever, um, the fact is that you know, if, if three or four years ago, 70 or 80 percent of the threats to the UK as perceived by the security authorities emanated from Pakistan. Um, it seems today that there's less, less threats are emerging and they are of less serious um, magnitude. So to that extent, I suppose, indirectly, they've welcomed it, but they've also been very conscious and have discussed with the Americans um, the other side to this, which is, which is the political, um, social, human reaction in Pakistan, which people are very um, conscious of. But this is a, a very, very difficult um, thing to balance and to, um, and to weigh, which is, I suppose, ultimately why it's not something which British governments have felt very inclined to take a, to take a, direct, to take a direct position on. Not least because I don't think the American policy will change. Um, uh, I think that uh, I was saying before that, um, that the way um, Obama has approached this, to my mind, has been he's, he's wanted to reduce um, the risk involved, the different risks involved in American foreign policy while maintaining leadership and ideally maintaining security uh, at home. And one of the ways of doing that has been to end ground wars, uh, first to surge but then to come back in Afghanistan, but definitely to keep to a tight timetable in Iraq and get the troops out. Um, but nevertheless, to have some capability of um, taking action against people who, um, who present uh, a threat. So that is, it's a new style of um, warfare, if you like, um, that has been adopted. Uh, lots of people debate the, the legal and other aspects uh, of it. Um, but it, I don't think that it's likely to change. It was a policy initiated by Bush. It's been intensified by a Democratic um, uh, president. Um, and I think America, and he said actually during the election campaign that, um, that, he, would, that he would act on actionable uh, intelligence in relation to Pakistan. And indeed, that's, um, that is what he's, uh, what he's done. So I think, you know, whether it's Obama or whether it's Romney next time round, the likelihood to me is that, that, will, that those sort of attacks um, will uh, continue with the emphasis on you know, making sure that the intelligence is as strong as possible 
and, um, and avoiding damage wherever possible, which we know um, is not something which is ever realized at 100%. So that's, I think, um, what the position is. Um, you're probably smiling not through pleasure, but because you've heard it before. <laughs> <laughs> it's more about the, fact, the evidence base of it. There was a report just yesterday from Stanford University and NYU about actually, because road attacks, you can't actually confirm on the ground whether the militants that the report are killed are actually alleged militants, because nobody knows whether they're civilians or militants. And you're actually creating more terrorists of a mindset because you're killing so many civilians on the ground. No, I, I certainly accept the second point, and that's what I'm saying. I think people are very conscious of that second point, the effect on the wider population um, of, of, these, of these attacks, um, particularly if they, if they are seen to be um, sort of indiscriminate and not to have the broad support of the um, Pakistan government, which is another thing which has been you know, uh, um, maybe ambiguous from the start. On your first point, I'm not, um, you're probably right that that's not possible in 100% of the cases, plainly it isn't. But I think that there, there certainly have been quite a number of cases where action by the Pakistani authorities is able to identify the, the individuals who are the immediate target of the attack through DNA samples or whatever. I think that is, you know, very generally, certainly with the better known um, targets, that is possible and desired, I would think, by, by, um, by both sides, and has happened quite frequently. Jim from there. No gentleman, really. Charles Rice, uh, formerly of the Evening Standard. Um, I wondered whether how much damage you thought might be done, if any, to our defense relationship and intelligence relationship with the United States by what seems to be the approaching <coughs> merger of our own British aerospace and the uh, Franco-German um, uh, Spanish company EADS. Uh, probably at the expense of a lot of activity alongside the Americans. And I do want to tag on just a you're off always, topic. John, off. You, you're always the same. There's always another question. You of know, course. A, you know. a very quick off topic. Yeah. I just wondered what you thought about our decision to share embassy premises and consular and other facilities, not with any of our EU partners, <laughs> but with the Canadians. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, EADS first, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I'm assuming, and I, I don't have any, any inside knowledge of this, but I'm assuming that a big part of the discussions which are going on now um, is about the American angle. There are lots of other moving parts of this. There is, you know, there are the angles of um, whether the French and German governments retain or acquire um, a sort of uh, a, con uh, a continuing interest in right of control of the of the companies. Um, there's the issue of, uh, of jobs, um, both for the you know, for the existing com for the existing EADS and for and for, and for British Aerospace. Um, and I think the American angle um, is critical in the setup of the new defense company which will, which will emerge, which will be essentially the existing BAE plus any defense elements, they're not large, um, in, uh, in um, EADS. But I'm also assuming that um, that, that would require um, really some of the same arrangements that BAE have to be maintained. And BAE have about, I think, close to 50% of their um, operations are now in the United States rather than elsewhere uh, in the world. And they do that through an American subsidiary, which is, very, which is legally distinct from um, the PLC leadership here. Uh, it's, um, it's headed by uh, an American. I think all, maybe all but one members of the board um, are Americans, not, uh, not Brits. There's one, I think, member of the BAE um, sort of British board who, uh, who's on it. And that um, is important, and America has these arrangements with other foreign defense companies. That is important to ensure that the technology sharing and information sharing can go ahead. And I'm assuming that you know, this deal you know, would, would be very difficult to maintain if they, weren't, if they didn't have confidence that uh, a successor company would be able to work in a similar way. And if it were able to work in a similar way, then it would have the same ability to compete for contracts in the United States um, as, uh, as, BAE, uh, as BAE does. But I would, you know, if I were 
um, you know, backing government. I would regard that US angle as very, very important to the success um, of the whole thing. And I assume a lot of discussion is going on. Oh, Canada. Um, I, I'm, I'm rather sort of, um, I'm sort of pragmatic about this. I mean, I think that I mean, there are already places in the world where we you know, share um, premises, I think, with, um, with other countries. I would have thought it would be very sensible in parts of uh, the Pacific, for example, or um, Southeast Asia, if there were an opportunity to share with Australia. I wouldn't think that was a problem. Um, I wouldn't think it was a problem to, to share with Canada in places where they have a particular, you know, particular role. I think cost saving is quite a good thing. You're going to need to keep some parts of embassies separate. It's mainly a question of sharing premises and getting some economies uh, out of that. I don't think it should be at the expense of the same sort of pragmatic arrangements with some of our European colleagues. So we, I think, in, um, in North Korea, I think we have this, we, we're in the German building. Um, in a number of other places, we share with Scandinavians or with Germans or whatever. Um, so, you know, I would say, um, not everywhere in the world, but in, cer in certain places, it makes sense to um, it makes sense to double up with, with people. So I'm not I'm not shocked by it. I wouldn't like it if it were not a pragmatic thing, but a sort of deliberate reaction against the um, against uh, cooperating with the um, with the other Europeans. I think you should be able to do that uh, in embassies as well. I think we have time for two more quick questions up there. No, just where you are. Hi, I'm Wolf Malfield, I'm just an international relations undergrad. Um, given that a relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom works in both directions, we have the US election coming up, and that's going to obviously affect the relations between that. But what do you think the effect of the next UK general election will have on the relationship? Do you think that will change depending on which candidate in the US um, makes it into the relationship, or, or not? Um, I think it comes back to the, the point that was made you know, a, few minutes, a few minutes ago. History suggests that, that um, uh, relationships go up and down a bit according to personal chemistry, the state of play at the time, all sorts of factors. But there's a sort of continuum. Um, and uh, there's a sort of sense in which the British Prime Minister and the American President have it as part of their job description to have a, to have a productive um, relationship. So, uh, and that has historically transcended uh, political uh, political party. So my sense is that you know that um, you know whichever of our political parties came out top in our next election, um, it would you know you you'd at least get to first base. There wouldn't be a breakdown or a crisis or a collapse or anything like that. Um, whether you go on from that um, to to work very closely together on the big issues depends on the policies of the two sides and the policies of an incoming British government. Do they want a very close relationship with the, with the United States? You've got to want it. You've got to work for it. Now, David Cameron said, rather frankly, we are the junior partner in this relationship. It probably matters more to us than it does to them. So you have to work at it. Um, are they going to put the, uh, the legwork in? Are they going to make those choices um, about what to say in public and what not to say in public? How to trade how to trade things off, as you do in any, in any relationship. So I think that's going to be the, the issue, not, not, the per, not particularly the personality um, uh, or the party affiliation of whoever it is. And one thing we, I think, I think as a, uh, maybe I would say this, wouldn't I, but I find helpful in British politics is there are still enough of our politicians who've had a spell um, at an American university and who, or who have, you know, who have that interest in American politics um, very much as part of their political makeup. And I think, you know, um, Ed Miliband is certainly one of those who's got an American past. Um, David Miliband did as well. Um, so a, a number of people, um, you know, have, have a sort of way of speaking and thinking, um, uh, being familiar with the way, you know, ways of speaking American and thinking American, which I think is helpful in this context. One final question, lady up there. Laura Patel from The Times. You said that you thought that further austerity and spending cuts on defence would negatively impact the relationship with the states. Could you expand on that a bit more? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, a little bit. Um, I, I just had a sense that with the last, with the last uh, strategic and defence review, which took place in the autumn of 2010, 
we were able to say at the end of that um, three things which uh, reassured the United States and others in the world that wanted the UK to remain um, uh, significant uh, in military terms globally. Um, the first thing was that we were going to um, stay at, at um, 2% of our, um, of our uh, GDP in terms of our defense uh, expenditure. Um, and we will just about maintain that um, up to uh, 2015. So the question is what happens, uh, what happens after that, particularly if our economy starts to recover. Um, the second thing is that um, we will remain, we will retain our um, nuclear uh, deterrent. Um, and obviously there's still a debate about how we do that with, between the coalition uh, parties, but were that to be revisited at some future point, um, that I think would, um, you know, would be an issue uh, in the United States, in public opinion and elsewhere. Um, and lastly, I mean, uh, we organize things, um, the government organized things in the defense review so that we could still say we're a sort of full spectrum power. There wasn't any aspect of, of military power going all the way through uh, special forces, cyber, land, sea, all, all the different areas where we have maintained um, a capability. Now we can do, um, as the Defense Review made clear, we can now intervene um, in smaller numbers and for shorter periods of time than was the case 10 or 15 years ago, or will be able to once the cuts have um, taken place. That's true, but we have maintained the essential um, the, the technical term, you know, the full spectrum capabilities. And I think that was reassuring to our NATO partners as well. So I think the issue is, for a new government coming in, do, the, you know, do those things get maintained? David Cameron said when he introduced the Defence Review um, in the House of Commons, um, um, whatever that was, it's, uh, two years ago now, um, he said that, um, speaking as um, um, a Conservative leader, if he were re-elected, that he would want to be uh, increasing the defense expenditure in real terms in the next parliament. Now obviously, you know, that depends on the, the election and the circumstances at the time. But I think it's going to require further effort to keep, to keep our, defense, our defense profile um, you know, uh, broadly, broadly where it is today. And I wouldn't just say defense, I deliberately said our intelligence and foreign policy assets too, they cost an awful lot less than our defense budget. Um, and certainly the Foreign Office budget is very, very much uh, smaller. But they're important assets if you're looking at it from the, um, from the outside. If you look at it in terms of Iran, for example, it's our intelligence and foreign policy assets above all that the United States would be, would be looking at. Nigel, you've done us proud. Uh, I'm going to cut it short now because we have hit quarter to eight. Uh, you've seen the level of interest. There are far more questions than we could cram in, but people will take comfort from the fact that no doubt they can besiege you over drinks next door. <laughs> uh, you've not only informed us in a factual way, but you've given us insights and nuance that few other people could. And I think that in this room there'll be quite a few nerds and White House watchers. Certainly all of us will watch the run up to the election, the election and its aftermath in a very much more informed way. It, uh, I don't know if you know, but if you, uh, uh, you actually occupy a place in Google next to uh, a railway engine, which is called after another Sir Nigel. And, the, and those of us who are transport nerds as well as American election nerds know that that particular locomotive was proverbial for both its style and its performance. You've shown us tonight how apt the juxtaposition is. Thank you very much. Brilliant. That was brilliant. It was super. Thank you so much. It was really great. Thank you.